Hello, I'm Tracy Matisak, and I'm talking with Rajiv Peshavria. He is someone who has made his mark by developing leaders and delivering business strategy. Uh, Rajiv has served as Chief Learning Officer for organizations like Coca-Cola and Morgan Stanley, and he also is one of the founders of the acclaimed leadership academy called Pine Street at Goldman Sachs. In the course of his work, Rajiv has focused on what he calls personal and organizational leadership energy, and he writes about that in his new book, Open Source Leadership. Rajiv, welcome to Skillsoft's Off the Shelf. Thank you. So what exactly do you mean by open source leadership? So let me start talking about uh, open source first. So the term open source obviously comes from technology. It's open source software versus closed uh, source software, Linux versus Windows. Uh, and uh, what we're describing the current era is the open source era, where everything is open, everything is connected, there is no such thing as privacy. Uh, Ordinary people are really empowered more than ever before because everybody has a supercomputer in their pockets. Uh, and leaders, on the other hand, are completely exposed to the extent of being naked. So that's, called, uh, that's how we call the open source era. And open source leadership, to your question, is how do you lead and manage in a time where ordinary people are really empowered uh, and leaders are exposed to naked? And that really speaks to some of the unique challenges then that leaders are facing in the 21st century. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you argue that the traditional model of inclusive, democratic leadership that has traditionally been embraced is not necessarily the most effective way to go. In fact, you talk about top-down autocratic leadership. Are you suggesting that that's the more effective way to go? That's right. Uh, and I know that sounds strange, but let me explain. So, you know, uh, the, the phenomena that they got very interested in was uh, this. Uh, you go to a, a, a bookstore or any place looking for leadership literature and you pick up anything at random and it sings the praises of all-inclusive, democratic, I love you all kind of leadership, right? And yet, you look into real life and you look at people like Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, to take a few business examples, or you take a look into politics and going east, uh, the founder and uh, former prime minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, and these people were complete autocrats. And they are the ones who've rocked the history of the planet in recent times, right? So which is right? All the literature that says, I love you all, leadership is the right way to go, or it's these people? So we said, let's find out. And we uh, asked 16 and a half thousand people in 28 countries, what do you think? And without exception, each of those 28 countries and the sample sizes were valid and relevant in each country, came back saying, uh, to achieve breakthrough success, you need autocratic leadership. So what does that look like, practically speaking? So it ba basically, it, it boils down to what leadership is in the first place, right? So. In the last century, if you showed up at work and did a great job administratively, you were called a leader, right? Uh, if you were living in Asia uh, and somebody came up with a new idea somewhere in the US, if you were the first person to bring that new idea from the US to Asia and implement it, you were a leader, right? Uh, that's how the term best practice came about. In the 21st century, it's all about speed. It's all about innovation because the moment a new idea comes out, it's, got, it's out there everywhere, right? So now it's not about copying other people's behavior. The day's best practice are over. Secondly, today's era has, yes, exciting opportunities because of connectivity. Um, uh, you know, so many things are possible that were never possible before. So very exciting how uh, people and capital and information can move almost f without friction. But there are also daunting challenges. We are seven and a half billion people on the planet today, going up to 10 billion. And uh, who's gonna feed all these people? Who's gonna find water for all of these people? You know, six billion out of seven and a half of us have uh, mobile phones, but only four and a half billion of us have access to a clean working toilet, just to give you a sense. Nobody's talking about this part of the Asian century. <laughs> if you will. So what I'm trying to say is that today's era is full of exciting opportunities and daunting challenges. Just showing up to work and commanding people to do what they want you want them to do because you have a big title is not going to cut it. Today, leadership is about 
a burning desire to create a better future. Much has been said about likability, and I'm wondering, Rajiv, is it possible to reconcile being an autocratic leader with being likable? So, yes and no. You know, being liked, being loved is a, uh, is a human condition. Most of us like being liked, most of us like being accepted and loved. But here's the problem with leadership. If leadership is about creating a better future, you've seen a picture uh, of tomorrow that other people haven't seen, and the moment you share that vision with people, they don't like you. Uh, because um, however beautiful a picture you may be painting, people like the certainty of today better than the uncertainty of tomorrow. So the moment you say, I want to create change, you open yourself to resistance, right? You're lonely, you're unpopular, you're misunderstood. Uh, but you look at anybody that has created a better future in history, they have had to be autocratic because initially people don't understand your picture because you have seen that picture that others cannot see. So initially you are disliked, initially you are misunderstood. But you know the flip side is also true. You look at all those people who are democratic, I love you all kind of leaders, the all-inclusive types, history doesn't remember them. They're mostly unremarkable. But the ones that history remembers and loves eventually are the people who were initially disliked because they were autocratic, but because now the world can understand what they did, people, uh, history loves them. So hence I said yes and no. One of the points that you make in the book is that less supervision can actually lead to greater productivity. And I'm wondering how that squares mm. with the idea of being an autocratic leader, yet being sort of a hands-off leader as well. Yeah. So. First, let's talk about autocratic, right? So we are saying, and our data is saying that in order to create change in a high-speed economy, you need to be autocratic because today, just about anybody can jump into any debate, and if you look for consensus, you're not gonna find it, right? The point is how the data says you need to be autocratic, yet everybody is, is today empowered with a supercomputer, and they're connected on social media. Even if you wanna be autocratic, people are not gonna let you. So how do you be autocratic? That's the, uh, the dilemma of, 20, of 21st century leadership. And coming back to, uh, to your earlier point about how do I balance that and leave people free, first of all, we have to earn the right to be autocratic. You have to have the reputation of being a better future builder so people will let you be autocratic. Right? You gotta give people freedom within the framework. Okay, here are the value systems of this organization and you're free to do whatever you want within that. Uh, things like that, right? Now about how do you reconcile setting people free and being autocratic? Well, whether you like it or not, the open source era is here. And 40% of the US workforce, by some estimates, is already a free agent. And free agents have a lot of freedom. An Uber driver has a lot of freedom. He decides when to drive, he decides when not to drive. Okay, he decides how much money he wants to make and he drives that much or that little. You cannot afford to treat full-time employees uh, with the way we used to in the last century because they demand the same kind of freedom. And uh, the new idea here is set them free. Today, I have the, the, the ability to choose how much I want to work, how little I want to work. Whether you do anything or not in your organization, performance is going to fall on a bell curve. 20% of your people are going to be high performers who are going to produce 80% of the results. 60% are gonna be in the middle and 20% at the bottom. So telling everybody you gotta work hard, you gotta to go to the best of your ability, you gotta go above and beyond is not gonna work because it's going to fall that way anyway. Why not tell people, choose where you wanna be and have an honest conversation. If uh, I wanna work absolutely at the minimum because my passion lies in theater, not in this job, if I could have an honest conversation with you boss, I want to do a good job and do as much as is required, but I'm not ambitious to be CEO. Pay me the minimum, but let me do minimum. Is that okay, boss? What's wrong with that conversation? Completely different paradigm than what we're used to. Absolutely. You mentioned best practices a moment ago, and certainly there's been a lot said about that, about core competencies, but in the book you say that those things are less important than what you call leadership energy. Yes. What is that? So historically, we have looked at leadership uh, or leadership education as a set of competencies that we must teach you. Okay, so here's what made Jack Welch the greatest leader of the last century. So you GE employee, we're gonna teach you the 13 competencies that made Jack Welch successful. And if you can copy those 13 competencies, you'll be as successful as Jack Welch. Great, until 1985. 
Why? Because business was predictable. The world was predictable. So what are we talking about here? Looking in the rear view mirror and copying Jack's behavior is going to make you a leader in the next, gen, uh, next 10 years? Those days are over. Cannot. They, oh, today, as I said earlier, given the challenges, you have to define leadership as a burning desire to create a better future. And to meet that resistance, you're going to ha need tremendous intrinsic strength. That's what we call leadership energy. Another idea that has been talked about quite a bit is emotional intelligence and how important that is in and out of the workplace. But you talk about emotional integrity and you say that that's even more important. Yes. What does emotional integrity mean and why is it more important? So let's start with emotional intelligence. Lots has been said, written, taught about emotional intelligence. In fact, people are making uh, a ton of money by creating uh, you know, assessments on emotional intelligence and things like that. Great. Emotional intelligence is important, but it's basically two simple things. One, you must understand your own emotions and handle them intelligently. Two, you must understand the emotions of other people and deal with them intelligently. Well, nothing wrong with that. If I go around the office saying exactly what I want to say to people's faces, I will be in trouble. So yes, I agree, emotional intelligence is important. But it's not the be-all and end-all of leadership or career development as it's been made out to be. What's, what should come before emotional intelligence is the inner work. Emotional intelligence is the outer work, how I behave with the other world, but with, with the people in, in the world. Emotional integrity is my own inner work. It's the courage to look in the mirror and admit to yourself what you really want without worrying about what society thinks. I'll give you a simple example to, uh, to bring out this concept of emotional in integrity. We ask a question all around the world, collecting data. What's the most important thing in your life? What do you care about the most? Can you guess what is the most common and the most popular answer anywhere in the world? I would say family. Exactly, family. But it's not true for a lot of people. And yet they say it. Why? Because it's a societally correct answer to give. That's not emotional integrity. If you cannot make yourself happy, you cannot make other people happy. A lot of people for whom family is the wrong answer say family is the most important thing to me, yet they bring out their frustrations of the day on whom? On their family when they come home. And uh, I can tell you from my own experience, once I understood that my work and my, uh, what I'm do trying to do in my own humble way is my number one priority, even over family, I became a better father and a better husband with that realization and that acceptance. So that's emotional integrity. So it's not operating on a false premise or Precisely. saying what you think is the accepted thing to say and then trying to adjust your exactly life accordingly. Right. Emotional intelligence is an on the surface skill. Emotional integrity is deep inside. Can you give us an example of a leader that you think has a well-developed sense of emotional integrity? Well. A lot of leaders um, uh, come to mind uh, who, if you have really managed to create a better future, chances are you have a lot of emotional integrity. And the person I talk about a lot is, is Howard Schultz of Starbucks. You know, he knew right from the beginning what he wanted, and he knew what he was and he, what he wasn't, and he made no bones about it. And you look at that as a commonality on most great leaders that have uh, rocked the history of the planet. Uh, from Martin Luther King to Gandhi to present day leaders who are making a huge difference in the lives of their people, one of the things you will find in common is they are who they are. They don't lie to themselves. Most people though, lie to themselves. What about goal setting, Rajiv? Um, for individuals and for organizations, how would open source leadership have us change the way we go about goal setting? The standard procedure is you tell all your employees to write stretch goals go above and beyond and you got to do it. If you don't achieve those goals, you're not going to get a good review and if you don't get a good review, you won't get paid very well. Well, there is something called the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle that has stood its ground since 1906, which says that 20% of the effects, or 80% of the effects, I'm sorry, are, uh, are because of 20% of the causes. In other words, 20% of your people produce 80% of the results, right? So why ask everybody to write stretch goals when you know that only 20% are going to achieve them? What if you said to people, you can work absolutely the minimum, but as I said earlier, you have to have an honest conversation. If I choose to work at the minimum, I, I better be prepared on two things. A, if I fall below the minimum, I get fired. B, my rewards will also be at the minimum. 
I could be a young mom who wants to take her foot off the pedal for the next two or three years because I want my priority is my, my baby. But I don't want to quit. Boss, I want to do absolutely the minimum to keep my job, pay me the minimum, and yeah, I won't fall below that. But three years later when my child is in uh, daycare, I'll come back on the, uh, on, on the gas. What's wrong with that conversation? And that's how goal setting in the open source era is going to change. So the criticism is, oh, but if I ask, allow everybody to do the minimum, my company will go down in the dumpers. No, you won't, because 80-20 will still prevail. 20% of your people are going to come to you. What do you mean by minimum? I want to do the maximum and more. They are the other ones who are going to produce 80% of the results anyway. So all we are saying is on that bell curve, let people choose where they want to be. That's the open source era. It's about authenticity. It's about authenticity. It's about having those honest conversations and know the company will not suffer. What about um, taking the temperature of employees within an organization? Um, lots of organizations use employee engagement surveys. Um, open source leadership, not so much. Yeah, so this is a very interesting phenomenon. You know, so a traditional company, traditional employee engagement survey goes something like this. Uh, you create a questionnaire uh, of maybe 100 or more than 100 statements. You send it out to all employees people majority and they, they, they push you hard to participate so a lot of people participate then the, the the data on each item is averaged so all employees input straight average and you get the top 10 and the bottom 10 and then senior management gets together along with HR and says what can we do to prop up the numbers for the following year and all, here comes all kinds of one-size-fit-all initiatives that are supposed to drive the numbers up the next year right this is exactly how it works now if you believe in the Pareto principle that 20% of your people do eight, produce 80% of the results and believe that the remaining 80% are not bad people, just that their needs are different, what happens to the voice of your most important 20% if you average the data in an employee survey? It gets drowned under the voice of the other 80, isn't it? So if you act on such data, are you encouraging mediocrity in your company or excellence in your company? My case rests. Right? I do not understand why in all these years, nobody has pointed out this basic mathematical uh, fallacy. And to the best of my knowledge, a Pareto principle or 80-20 has still not been debunked. So it still holds. And the bell curve of 20-60-20 is a derivative of the 80-20 anyway. How about succession planning? Um, does open source leadership have a different way of going about identifying uh, those who will be leaders of the future? Yeah, so let's again talk about what the traditional way is first. So, and I worked in some such companies as well. So, you know, you go through a battery of psychometric assessments, you go through assessment centers, you go through interviews, uh, and then a committee decides in the end with all that so-called data whether you are a high potential or not. And then companies take pride in, we have a very strong hypo pool, if you will. And then these so-called hypos are given all kinds of training, they're sent to business schools, they're given mentoring and coaching, and they're given stretch assignments and what have you, with the hope that three to five years from now, these so-called high potentials are going to be future leaders of the company, right? Uh, GE, uh, back in the 80s gave us something called the nine box grid where you plot your entire population of employees uh, performance on one side potential on one side and nine boxes and the people on the top right hand corner are your future high potential leaders again it worked beautifully up until the 80s because business was very predictable what's the guarantee that these people that you're anointing today as your tomorrow's leaders are going to stay with you in the next five years what's the guarantee that the skills you're teaching them through traditional methods are going to be valid five years from now in a high-speed economy, right? Is this a lottery system or what? So I am asked, oh, you're a hypo, you're going to go to this leadership acceleration program. You'll be very thankful that you've been invited. As part of this six-week program, you're going to work on a project over and above your day job, uh, which is going to be great. And then you're going to get a chance, to, if your project is selected, you're going to get a chance to present it to senior management and to the board. I'm already working 20 hours a day. That's why you put me in the hypo pool. You think I have time for more make up, made up work? So I'm not happy. The guys who are not in the program, which is the majority of the people, say I don't have a future in this company because I wasn't selected as a hypo. So they're not happy. So what are we talking about here? That's traditional succession planning for you. In open source leadership, what we say is abolish all of that. 
You know, there's a whole machinery within HR that does nothing but create a spreadsheet that goes to the board once a year, talking about, you know, who are, what are the key positions, who are the key people that we are grooming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ab abolish all of that. Instead, what if the CEO said every year, uh, when, when everybody comes back from vacation, Happy New Year, people. Uh, here's an idea. I'm launching the CEO's challenge, whereby anybody in the company that has any idea to add value to the company in any which way you think, reduce cost, increase revenue, increase productivity, whatever it might be, form a team, submit your idea uh, headline by a certain date, submit the project plan by a certain date. We will evaluate all the projects and the top 10 projects will be presented to the board. Now, nobody will be tapped on the shoulder for participating in this program and nobody will be disallowed either. It's totally open. So no more hypos, but anybody can participate. Guess what? The people who raise their hand every year and say, I wanna participate, here's my idea, and they come up with those good ideas year after year after year, aren't they your future leaders? You've taken care of leadership development and succession planning naturally by letting the cream rise to the top. You've also um, uh, you know, solved company problems or exploited new opportunities of virtually no cost at all. And the board and senior management gets a real line of sight as to who the real talent is and not relying on artificial things like assessment centers and what have you. So rather than going through the process of elimination, you're allowing these future leaders to self-identify. Absolutely. In a sense. Absolutely. Because you know, you can't inject in energy in me. If I am if I have leadership energy and I want to show you, I'm gonna raise my hand. So lots of millennials entering the workforce now. Mm -hmm. um, how should leaders think about dealing with them differently than they have in the past? They shouldn't. That's the short answer. Uh, I love it when a bunch of uh, older people get in a room and complain about millennials. I just love it. So this is what you've heard many times. Oh, these millennials don't get it. They don't have the kind of work ethic that our generation had. They want, every, they want everything the easy way out just because they can have it. They just don't want to work hard. You know what my, my response to that is? Okay, uh, do you use Google Maps or Waze when you're driving from one city to the other? Yeah, we do. Why don't you keep an atlas in your car instead? because Google Maps is easier, because you can have it? Do you use uh, Quicken or Intuit to keep your books? Oh, yeah, we use. Why don't you keep your books manually? Because the other one is easier, because you can have it? So what's wrong with these millennials? Suddenly there's stunned silence when I ask them these questions. The point is, instead of complaining about the millennials, understand that the open source era is here. Accept this reality and move on. Uh, and who says that millennials are not hardworking? Look at college kids and the kind of pressure they have these days. I don't remember being in college and having half the kind of pressure that my kids have in college right now. So this idea that you know millennials are different. Uh, you know, uh, my parents probably said the same thing about me when I was a teenager. Oh, he's always outside playing in the yard with old neighborhood kids. And now we say, oh, they are, he's always on a screen somewhere playing video games. But that's, and I'm sure my grandparents said the same thing about my parents when they were kids. So this whole millennial thing is, is overblown. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, big data. How do you believe that leaders can leverage big data, the internet of things, to maintain success going forward? That's a huge question. Uh, and there is no one single answer. All I will say is whether it's big data, whether it's internet of things, whether it's digital, keep your eyes and ears open. Ask the question. What are the core competencies of our company and how is our company successful today and how long is that success gonna last? What's coming or might come that will completely obliterate the need for our products and our services? Keep asking and be prepared to cannibalize your own products uh, because if you, you cannot beat the pace of change. The change is only gonna get faster and faster with technology. Uh, barriers are breaking down faster than you can say anything these days. The only thing you can do is stay ahead of that curve and say that, how can we reinvent ourselves? How should we be? Today, for example, uh, Uber and Lyft and these app-based taxi companies are all the rage with these unheard of valuations. But we know that that model is not gonna last very long because driverless cars are on the way. Why do you think Uber is investing so much in the research of driverless cars? Because they are anticipating the future and saying who is going to or what is going to obliterate the value creation that we have today. That's what you need to do. 
You have said, Rajiv, that this book, Open Source Leadership, is not a how-to book mm -hmm. for people to follow steps. How would you have readers approach this book? So I call it a think book. And the reason is nobody can write a how-to book anymore. You know, how-to books were a, a 20th century phenomena. Today, it, the moment you say, I know how to, you're kidding. You, 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 you're joking because nobody knows how to. It's all about how can I think? How can I elevate my thinking? How much am I willing to struggle with questions rather than answers? And it's all about the right questions rather than the answers. And then figure it out as you go. And be, be comfortable with failure. Try many, many new things. And, and the most innovative companies, eight out of 10 of their, of their innovative uh, efforts fail, but they celebrate the two that succeed. And that's what uh, the open source era is all about. You build failure into the process. And be proud of it. What is one step that a leader can take today, this week, in the very near future to become more of an autocratic leader and to really move toward genuine open source leadership? So first of all, earn the right to be autocratic. Build the reputation of being a better future creator so people will let you uh, be autocratic. Number two, master the dance of the naked autocrat. Naked autocrat being leaders are naked, everybody's empowered, so you need to be an autocrat in this era, so naked autocrat. What is the dance of the naked autocrat? Be completely autocratic about your values and your purpose because you've arrived at them slowly, deliberately, and carefully. At the same time, be completely humble and respectful with people. So hence the dance of the naked autocrat. Third, provide, start providing freedom within a framework. I can't tell you how many companies say we want our people to think and act like owners, and yet we keep putting them in boxes and boxes of rules, policies, procedures that they can't even breathe, let alone think. You want people to think and act like owners, give them freedom within the framework, meaning build a culture based on values, not based on rules. You know, the guy who was uh, Dr. Dao, who was uh, dragged from the uh, airplane uh, in a bloodied condition, uh, the first response of the CEO was, oh, my people were only following, following procedure. Was that a response or was that a response? What if those people, instead of following procedure, had lived the values, which I'm sure are in the hallways of the airline, everywhere. And I'm sure those values don't say you beat up a passenger and, and drag them out, right? So this idea of moving away from, from rules to values, freedom within the framework. Number four, continuously reflect, listen, and learn, because things are changing so fast. If you think you know anything, think again. And finally, learn, and forgive more and more. Why forgive more and more? Not because it's a nice thing and because it liberates your soul. Yes, it does. But the more business reason for forgiving is if you want innovation in your company, you better forgive and better celebrate fa failure like we were talking about earlier. Rajiv, you have given us quite a lot to think about. I want to thank you for sharing those insights with us. It seems that open source leadership really shows individuals and organizations how they can learn to lead more autocratically in the right way and be more open with we their call colleagues it and their teams. Autocracy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And we invite you to uh, check out the book as well. Add it to your Skillsoft playlist. It's an important book. It's called Open Source Leadership.